Hey everyone, so I've spent a whole bunch of years researching cryptocurrencies. I've put it all, my process, my framework for doing all of this into one document, into one video. Um, this is my crypto research system to find 100x altcoins. And this is obviously a step-by-step -step guide. Now, I will say, this isn't for everyone. It's going to be very, it's going to be unedited the whole time. It might be a very long video. I don't know how long this is going to go on for. Um, but if you are someone who doesn't really want to pay attention to actually learning how to research, there is a link that you will have on this document. And it's going to link you out to support for anyone who's affected by gambling. So it's for, for people who are addicted to gambling, which I think if you're not willing to look at a framework for understanding how to do this, you are gambling in crypto. So I wanted you to get some help uh, there as well. Obviously, it's a little joke, but it's also kind of quite serious. So as we're going to go through this document, um, I want you to be prepared. Your This isn't like a, a fun video to watch. This is actually useful. So there's step by steps, how to define these things. It's backed up by scientific understandings and, and all kinds of stuff. So you might want to just exit the video now and come back later if you're not in the mindset to get some work done. Um, this is 10 pages. 10 pages of information here that are going to really give you actually how you research these cryptocurrencies. Um, and, you know, I think once you've got this, you, you just start making better decisions. So um, take it or leave it. We're going to get started. Uh, if you do go on to enjoy this and you want to see more videos like this, loads, loads a ton of effort have got, has gone into this, then hit subscribe. Let me know in the comments and all of that. Um, but let's get into it. So Really, the, the first thing that we really need to start understanding is, it, you know, if you want to start researching, the, there's a core foundation of all of it. And that core foundation is understanding where we are in time. And so not only do you have to think about, you know, you have to understand crypto and you have to understand blockchain, but you also have to understand where we are in this moving timeline of time and space, right? And so there is such an important emphasis put on our current stage that we have to have complete awareness. And just like catching the internet wave and how that changed everything, we do need to get a grip on crypto and blockchain because it could be our ticket to creating generational wealth. Um, and so there's this whole thing called educational psychology where uh, it emphasizes the significance of building foundational knowledge to achieve deeper understanding and competence, meaning that if you can understand the foundations, the basics, what is blockchain, what is crypto, it puts you in a position where you can you can then move on to get that deeper understanding and have that competence. And having that understanding and having that com competence allows you to see details that others won't see. And so if we're researching, the basics and the foundations are really quite important, right? I, I think you, you can see that. So having that educational psychology and, and that psychology of wanting to learn and understand foundations will allow you to evaluate the opportunities, see the risks, and notice the innovations within the blockchain ecosystem. Um, and so I would say, as it stands right now, learning about crypto and blockchain is essential, like right now, just like the uh, internet was uh, way back when. So something I wanted to kind of expand on that thought idea, uh, thought idea, I don't know what I'm saying. Something to expand on that thought is the diffusion of innovations theory. Now, according to the diffusion of innovations theory, they have a series of transitional blocks, the phases that happen when we're in adoption. And so those different adoption phases are you know, 2.5% of people will be innovators. Those are the first to the space. 13.5% will be early adopters. Early majority will be 34%. The late majority will be 34%. And the laggards will be 16%. The laggards are obviously too late. You're too late. Um, and all of the gains are basically gone at that point. If we're certainly looking at, you know, building generational wealth, you don't want to be late to something, right? I think that's pretty simple. And so when you look at the diffusion of innovations theory, they actually put us right now in crypto and blockchain in the early adopters transitioning into the early majority phase. 
So yes, it would be ideal to be an innovator in this space. And there's certainly many things I'm doing in my business right now to put me in the innovator space, uh, certainly in, in tokenization, for example. Um, I, I'm positioning myself as an innovator in tokenization, but more on that later. But for crypto and blockchain, when we're looking at opportunities, we're, we're transitioning from basically, we're, we're in the first half between the early adopter and the early majority phase. So we're moving into early majority. I thought that was just critical to understanding where we are in crypto right now. And obviously when you want most upside, you want to be earlier in the game. And so I would say still we are early, um, but we are getting to that point where we're getting into that middle of the bell curve where we might soon become in the next kind of three, four years, the late majority. And so you don't want to be there. You're not there. I just wanted to let you know where you are right now. And I would say we are early. So when it comes to understanding our position in the market, that's a different story and is also very important for us to know. So I've kind of looked into behavioral economics and cognitive biases and kind of put this little summary together for you. So irrationalities and psychological biases influence financial decisions and market movements. So not just your own decisions, but also once us as individuals make individual uh, decisions, financial decisions, the market moves as a result of that. And understanding them um, will lead to, yeah, so, so I'm reading that wrong. You need to understand them because they lead to emotional and herd-like behavior that drives the market cycles. And so when you look as a whole at the whole population, these biases that people have result in the markets making their moves. And those markets make their moves in, in flows. And there's two primary emotions that drive that flow of the market. And those are fear and greed. We've all heard of fear and greed. There's even that indicator that you can find on, on the internet called the fear and greed index, which tells you where the market is in fear and greed. Now, fear is closely associated with selling and f greed is associated with buying. You're buying more, buying when you don't need to be buying and you're kind of selling when you don't need to be selling. That's what kind of happens in the end. So you get this, oh, sorry, my mic. So you get this whole up and down in the market, which is how it happens. It's, it's a behavioral thing that happens. Now, of course, there are kind of, influences in the market like institutions or whale purchases and and sales that that also affect things and then the whole you know conspiracy that things are being manipulated which i don't think really is a conspiracy it's more of a fact but we have to at the core understand these fundamentals that fear and greed drive the market and so um the fear and greed can really only creates these bubble moments when the prices go up really high and then they crash back down that's a bubble and then those crashes at the bottom, when it crashes down, it's almost like a fear bubble that, that pops. And then once the fear bubble has popped, the prices go back up again. Um, but fear and greed are driving all of that to happen. Now, one thing I think that's really, really important here is that because the herd mentality is typically wrong, because um, we want to avoid herd mentality, it's sometimes useful to have what's called the contrarian approach. And so you need to take a con contrarian approach to the whole sentiment of the market. How, how is the market looking right now? Is everyone like saying, oh, I'm, I'm selling immediately or I'm buying right now and I'm FOMOing in. Those are emotional things that are happening. And so you can take the con contrarian approach and say, actually, if everyone is really greedy, I'm going to take the fearful approach. If everyone is really fearful, I'm going to take the greedy approach. It's exactly what was said all those years ago, um, buy when everyone is fearful, sell when everyone's greedy. It's the same thing, but at its core level, it's a scientific, um, there's a scientific element to all of this, you know? And so we have these psychological biases that we kind of go through. And so I've just listed a few that I could think of. So for example, we have overconfidence. Overconfidence obviously being quite an emotional uh, feeling. And you can overestimate your knowledge and ability to predict the markets. Um, and obviously we don't want that because that's an emotional decision. You've also got the herd behavior, which is the tendency to follow and mimic what others do 
which can lead to those inflated bubbles or unwarranted panic selling. And so we want to have a contrarian approach to confidence and to herd behavior. Then we also have something called loss aversion, which is really interesting. This is the fear of losing money is actually stronger than the desire to make money. So I wonder if that applies to you. It should, because it's a scientific kind of truth. We don't want to lose more than we want to win. So that's quite interesting. Um, we have this fear of, of loss. That's what it is, loss aversion. And so what that will do is it will create an environment where you sell at the worst time and you buy at the worst time, right? And this is what we, this is what we see. When the prices all go down, people are selling because they're afraid it's going to go further down because they have this fear of loss. And when it goes, when the prices go up, they hold on because they have the fear that they're going to lose out on more, which is that FOMO, fear of missing out. And so all of these things drive emotions. And the last one being recency bias. And recency bias is when you give more weight or more credence to recent events um, and almost believing that these short term events that happen will continue in indefinitely you know, like the peak of a market. It's going to continue forever. <laughs> uh, no, that's emotional thinking. And if you take the contrarian approach, it means going against the crowd. And so in order to do that, you have to recognize your emotional extremes. You know, look for the signs of greed and fear in the market, um, because that obviously indicates bottoms or bubbles being popped. And these extremes are where the contrarian investors find their opportunities. It's these extremes that you need to be looking for. So in the market, in trading, you can either go long or you can go short. So long is betting that the price is going to continue going up. Shorting is betting that the price is going to actually come down. And so if you're seeing, just as a plain example, this isn't like advice or anything, but the, the plain example is if you are going for the contrarian option, you see the prices go up, you see extreme greed, in the market, that would be a time to go short, right? Because now you can bet against the rest of the market. Um, and you don't have to go short, you could also just sell crypto that you have uh, in order to repurchase down at a lower point because you're just reading the market sentiment at that point. Um, the second thing you can do is assess your fundamental values. So instead of getting swayed by the market sentiment, focus on the fundamental utility value of assets. And when you do this, um, you have to, it obviously requires lots of research and, and understanding. Um, but when you do this, you start to see that your decisions get a lot better. So if you, just to give some examples, you might have like Floki Inu coin, which is just totally abstract and really has no utility value. But if you focus on the utility value of the assets rather than the market value, you can really make these emotionless decisions because you know, like XRP, for example, has massive real world utility. So when the market fluctuates and it goes up and it goes down, up and down, up and down, you can you can say, OK, I'm not worried about the value of that asset on the marketplace right now. What I am concerned about is the long term value because it has true utility. And so when we get later on into this, we're really I'm really teaching how to find the utility assets um, and how to have confidence in those in those decisions because uh, we'll, we'll get into that but this is obviously we're on page no we're on page three we're on page three of ten um, and so the next stage is to be really to, to really have an understanding that you're probably going to feel like you're acting alone so part of this contrarian thing is investing against the rest of the crowd so it's likely that you're not going to be making popular decisions based on what the crowd is thinking. The crowd is saying this token is going to go continue going up and continue going up forevermore. And at that time, you're the one thinking, hmm, I'm going to sell now. <laughs> right. It's not going to be a popular decision. It's you're not a popular person in that instance. If you were making content when everyone was saying it was going up in value and you say it's going down, you're not getting any views. You're going to get loads of hate and all of that kind of stuff and you might not be making content, the chances are you're not, but it's the same thing. It's just a, just a, an example. You are going to be acting as a lone wolf in all of this. Um, when you actually, you're, when you're making the right decisions, you're not going to feel like everyone's making that decision. The really key, important understanding there. Um, and so 
obviously finally patience is key in this situation because where most people are thinking about uh, the short term you have you're here looking at strategies that require a longer term time horizon um, the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent so it's essential to have the patience to wait for your thesis to play out um, i guess what i'm trying to say is you've got to prepare for the emotional strain <laughs> of what's coming um, but now that we've got like this overarching idea of what it looks like in the market where we are in the market where we are in blockchain you know moving into these different phases it's now time to look you know not past where we can make decisions that are against the crowd but now where are we looking with those decisions because okay we're moving against the crowd but um where like we need a direction because without direction this is all pointless right it doesn't make any sense i'm just going to check that i'm recording because i could be doing all of this and not recording yeah, I'm recording. Um, and so now it's the time to really look into where the opportunities lie. And in order to do that, we're going to look at complexity science um, and systemic change. So complexity science basically is looking at how all the parts of a system can, can increase the value or attention um, to the collective behaviors of the system. And how the system interacts with the environment. So, um, if we can, if we can understand the parts of the system that haven't had attention, we know where the opportunities lie. So, you know, where this comes out in in on YouTube, for example, when you look at people talking about cryptocurrency and say they'll say something like ten low cap altcoins that haven't pumped yet. Well, there's a scientific reason for that. It's actually complexity science, looking at the whole environment as a whole and, and saying, OK, payments has got a lot of attention. This has got a lot of attention. Uh, tokenizing gold has a lot of attention. But these little areas of of the world and the environment don't have any attention. And so there's the focus of our attention. Um, and so these these provide us with the most ripe opportunities, as I've written there, for innovation and transformation. You're looking at sectors that have not been fully penetrated yet by blockchain technology. And so, yes, payments has been really penetrated by blockchain technology because there's so many blockchain companies focusing on payments right now. Now, I don't mean that to say that that's not a good investment. In fact, the vast majority of my portfolio is in payments. But I do think that on that adoption scale, we're still no further than where I said earlier. So we're still kind of that early adopter phase for payments. But you might, depending on your risk tolerance, might want to look for things that haven't even got any attention yet in blockchain. Um, I'm trying to think of <laughs> I'm trying to think of an area that hasn't been touched by blockchain yet. Um, let's say like a, a tree surgeon tree surgery companies there might be a let's say there's a billion dollar tree surgery company there's i don't think there is but um you might look at that and go oh well actually we'll get into this later on but i understand a problem in tree surgery and the process of a, a business in tree surgery um there's no i don't think there's any blockchain kind of penetrated that area we're going to get into the whole process of how to do that later on um but these are the types of things to be looking at like payments has got lots of companies tree surgery basically no companies looking at blockchain those can either be looked at as ripe opportunities for for growth and focus or they might just not be good at very good ideas but that comes with like risk tolerance as well and so bear markets within complexity science are often perceived negatively due to their association with the falling prices and economic slowdown but from a complexity science perspective these are periods in the market for system reorganization and, ad and adaptation. So now that we know we're in a bear market, we're, well, we're in a bear market, I'll just let you know. We're coming out of that bear market, but if you're looking at you know, projects that have been formed in a bear market or survived a bear market, I say I've been saying this for like, I said this two and a half years ago in some of my first videos here. You know, you want to, you want to look at assets that, have survived a bear market because all the assets that are the projects that have been made for capital gain for making money 
they're all dead, right? Because the prices have gone down and there's no money to be made by those companies, right? So you want to look at companies that have survived a bear market or were built early on in a bear market. So you know that they weren't there just for capital gain. Because what you'll notice is in the bull run, there'll be tokens popping up left, right, and center everywhere, almost every day, a new token, but they're all, it's all cash grab. And so that isn't a utility asset, that's a speculation asset. Uh, so the bear markets in complexity science should be seen as periods of system reorganization and adaptation. Now, industries that have yet to be fully dis dis disrupted by blockchain technology are likely to be untapped ecosystems where the introduction of this new technology being uh, blockchain can lead to significant shifts in how value is created, exchanged, and perceived in that project. So I think that's a, a nice little summary there of, of you know, how to focus, uh, the reasoning behind focusing on assets that haven't had all this disruption so far. Now, let's get a a new way of looking um, at blockchain adoption. And so this is really called systematic thinking, systems thinking. Um, and so the first thing you want to do is you need to analyze the leverage points. So systems thinking, and that's a, this is obviously a scientific thing, systems thinking, it's like a category, um, encourages us to identify leverage points within systems, places where small shifts could lead to significant changes in the system's behavior. So I, I, I wanted to use the tree surgery one, but it's not, it's just not a good idea. Um, let's say the energy sector where you've got oil coming out the ground. Um, the whole process of oil coming out the, the ground and then you have to refine that oil into the different variations of oil that you can get. That's just like, that just is the way it is. But the problem is, is that there's no tracking along the way of the pipes and those tracking, that tracking could lead to like, uh, automation for payments because in the energy sector you don't need to know this but it's providing you an example in the energy sector payments for the people who who work on the oil along that process are like 30 to 60 days after the process has happened and so there's this big delay in the payment of that and really a fund a tiny little shift in let's say uh, a, a blockchain running the supply flow of oil through that system and allocating payments, nice and fast payments along that process to pay people quicker would be a significant change in the whole system's behavior. You know, <laughs> like it would be, it would completely change that industry. Now, of course, if you're someone in oil, you will understand that problem solution thing that I've just talked about. If you're not in oil, we're going to get to things that you will be familiar with in a second. But because you will have, in my process here, because you'll have a key understanding of how these things work based on your experience, your professional experience, you will be able to identify leverage points. And so people, people are very obsessed about researching and, and trying to understand things when really you're built in with lots of key understanding as well. And um, this is why money has such a, such a large focus because lots of people are interested in money and it's an easier barrier to overcome to start learning about payments. Um, but we're going to we're going to make this this barrier to entry a lot lower for you in, in this little course thing here. And so. All the opportunities seem to be in the bear markets. I think that makes complete reasonable sense. Um, the prices are low. The value of these projects is really low. Um, I'll read it out here just to continue my thought. Bear markets make projects focus on real value, like I said earlier, utility and innovation rather than speculative gains. This is exactly what I said. The, the companies in the bear market are the ones to watch for because they weren't here just to make money. They're here to actually foster development of technologies and business models that are resilient, efficient and scalable. Really, really important things. We're going to get into that a little bit later on as well. Now, market corrections and investment opportunities. There are correction phases in bear markets, and those often eliminate the weak and unsustainable projects, leaving behind those with strong fundamentals and potential for long-term access. Just shows when there are corrections and the prices go down, the value of these assets goes down in a bear market, the ones that were here for money just disappear because they can't, they can't compete. And so what you have is a problem and a solution and that creates a systemic change. 
Now you've you know you you've been out you'll now understand that you have to identify these leverage points and understand you basically by now even even though i've not really said much by now you've already narrowed down even your selection of cryptocurrencies that you can invest in like the, the pool is already smaller just by logical thinking okay so this is why it's really i think this is really powerful so next we need to find some problems this is a key key element because this is usually tipped on the upside down based on how I think about it. Usually the real world, normal world operates the other way around, but we're starting, personally, we're starting at the right place now. So we're gonna focus on cognitive psychology, and this provides an insight into how individuals recognize and prioritize problems in their environment. One key concept is, availab is the availability heuristic. And this suggests that people tend to consider information that is readily available or recently announced as more representative or more important than it might actually be. So individuals are more likely to focus, uh, sorry, individuals are more likely to identify and focus on issues that they've seen more in media, which is why the media, like the news, they brush things under the rug that are really important by distracting us with things that entertain us, right? Just like the, the Titanic submarine that went down and imploded. That whole narrative was covering up something else that they didn't want to be seen. So we would talk via the availability heuristic. We would talk about that, the Titanic thing, and not the mo most important thing. Now, they're using that as a control tactic, but also understand that this control is being done to you in other ways in other industries. So if you scroll through uh, YouTube and you type crypto, and they're all talking about Bitcoin, which one are you going to focus on? You're going to focus on Bitcoin. Right. Because due to the availability heuristic, you're just going to put allocate more importance to things that are more people are talking about or that have been shown to you. Um, and so it's the same here. Um, so when we think about the availability heuristic, it can aid you because it can get you started, but it can also hinder your process of identifying genuine problems worth solving. So if Floki Inu coin or some made up radiator coin came up and everyone was talking about it, all of a sudden you, you're bringing more credence and importance to radiator token, um, but it doesn't actually do anything. So it's actually hindered your process of identifying a genuine problem because there's no, there's no problem being solved there. So um, understanding that, it helps you quickly, uh, sorry, I, I need to just read out what I've said here. It helps in, in quickly bringing to mind pressing issues. Okay, that's it. So one of the good thing is that, you know, in the, when I said the aid part, there's the aid part and the hinder part. So the aid part, how it can help is it can, if you get asked about something and it's something that you've heard about recently, then you, you can bring up that information very quickly. So it, it means it's more available in your mind, that the information is more available, but like I said earlier, it can lead to an overemphasis on certain problems while neglecting others that are less obvious, but equally or more significant. Um, so you're basically, it diverts your attention and you ignore things that actually are important, just like the Titanic sub submarine thing. Um, so the next step of the process, really, really important, is that now we're trying to connect problems to blockchain projects. Um, and so this is really like, I think the secret source of, of what I'm trying to teach here. And this is doing something called design thinking and you centric problem solving. Okay. So design thinking is a human centered approach to innovation that integrates the needs of people, the possibilities of technology and the requirements for business success. So that's design thinking. And so, Design thinking emphasizes deep empathy for the end user. Now, I want you to imagine being the end user. Okay, so we're creating a you centric problem solving framework here. So, if you do design thinking, it's a very human centered approach to like figuring out what's going to work. So, we focus on you. Um, and in that context, in the context of this, of this whole thing, we want to focus on problems that you recognize because you are the end user of something. 
and you're the end user of something that you're very knowledgeable about. And so when we look at this, if we're using this empathy element that I, I kind of touch on here, the core of their approach is empathy. <laughs> I can't speak now. The core of the approach is empathy, which involves putting yourself in the user's shoes, so putting yourself in your own shoes, but being aware of that to gain a deep understanding of the experiences, challenges, and desires. How much deeper could you go in understanding than focusing on yourself? Okay, so what we need to do is understand uh, the pain points that you experience. Okay, so let's think about this. I usually would go the professional route. So let's look at your job. Let's say, um, what could you be? What could you be? Let's say you're a payroll officer. Okay, very, this is a very, I'm like, this is low hanging fruit. But let's say you're, you're, you do payroll at a company and there's 10,000 employees at this company. You will understand the problems associated with payroll payments. You'll understand payment failures. You'll understand um, uh, the kind of nature of how payments don't operate 24-7. Um, they kind of have to be done at the end of the day. And it's just this whole system and they, the failure rate is ridiculous and people don't get their money on time. Or maybe there's an, one piece of incorrect information and the payment doesn't get delivered. Like you'll understand that. So you understand the problem of payroll payments. You, you truly do, at your core, understand that problem. And so you might, whatever job you have, or, what, or whatever job your parents have had, you know, because we often think our knowledge is only really knowledge that we've experienced, but like I know a lot about Pilates because my mum was a Pilates instructor. Like, I know a lot about all the muscles and the joints and you, you need to know how to stretch a specific muscle. I know the stretch to, to do that muscle, even no matter how kind of obscure it is, I know the stretch because I've, seen my mum put thousands of hours into it um you know and so you can do that for both parents and and you have this crazy understanding of these two different areas that you don't even think about being part of your understanding so tap into all of these problems that you see around people around you um and you can do that in in a, in a variety of different ways right so you can observe like your family and friends you can see the problems that they they look at you can look at like statistical surveys about problems that people are seeing um, in different industries you can google those things i'm gonna because i want it to be you centric i want to focus on the observation because people don't pay enough credence and value to their own gut feeling and, and internal understanding but then you can also look at interviews of people talking about this stuff and surveys or whatever but what you want to focus on here in terms of opportunities are the emotions being displayed in that problem the motivations behind fixing that problem and the behaviors that are exhibited as a result of the problem. So the behaviors exhibited as a result of payments not going through is frustration. People can't pay their bills because they didn't receive the payment in time. There's frustration with how the tax was allocated and, you know, there's stress, right? That would be a behavior um, and so on and so forth. I think that's pretty reasonable. Um, or you can focus it all on you. You can be the end user. You are the end user for certain problems. So this is why this is very different structure because typically the way you would look at researching cryptocurrency, if you ask anyone on, on YouTube, basically, they'll say, um, uh, you know, this one's undervalued, blah, blah, blah. Choose this one. It's like, well, that, that doesn't resonate with me. Like if I get told to invest in, I've got, I've got, I needed to think of loads of examples and put them in here. Um, let's say uh, like electricity and measuring electrical output in a home, like calculating the bills for your electricity bill. But, uh, and that's, that could be a problem because they don't read the, the gauge doesn't read properly. And then you get overcharged by your company and then you've got to claim it back. Like that's a problem that exists like they're, they're charging you more than, more than you've uh, used. If the blockchain was operating on that, for example, and some, somebody said, you've got to invest in this token that, that uh, is about blockchain energy. I'm like, I don't really understand the problem. I, in, that, in that instance, I do understand the problem, but there'll be problems that, you, that don't resonate with you or have, no, have played no role in your, 
in your life. So it, it's not you centric, it's kind of generic, um, but you kind of, you might be able to empathize with it, but um, we need it to be really focused on your core. The starting point at very least should be something you're familiar with, okay? I'm giving you a framework for researching, not, um, you know, that, uh, so, so that you can get started rather than, oh, here there's all these problems and solutions, just picking randomly. You wanna pick what's closer to your heart uh, and your understanding. Um, so here is a structured process for identifying solutions. So first we need to define the problems and you need to clearly articulate that that problem that needs to be solved. So you wanna focus on the user's needs and pain points as identified through empathy or own experience. Okay, so you're looking at this, you're thinking, I actually know the problem. Let's say the problem is, we'll, we'll stick to the payroll one. The problem is there are payment failures, okay? Uh, that is the problem. Clearly articulated failures and payments for payroll. Okay. Um, then you need to look at what the person, the end user needs. They need reliability. They need security. They need, they need confidence in the system and they need speed as well. And so you've got your solutions to those problems. And now you move on to step two. And this is now where you look for the blockchain solutions for those specific problems. So in this example, you'll go over to YouTube and you'll say, um, payroll payments on the blockchain, right? And you'll type that in into Google and then it will show you a load of companies that do payroll in blockchain. And that's just narrowed down the group even further. So now you started with like 4,000 cryptos. Now you're on like 15. <laughs> like how good is that for decision-making? You're, you're actually, you've identified a problem you understand the importance of the solution because you also understand the problem because you experience it. And now you're left with a very manageable research load. Okay. So now you're looking at the solution. You're making an, a solution fit. You have to ask key questions like, does this solution effectively address the user's needs, my needs? Does it, does the solution actually solve my problem? Um, and the key element to this as well is how does the blockchain part of the project actually add value versus the non-blockchain solutions. So for example, if if your payroll if you research this payroll thing, it might say we speed up this blockchain solution speeds up the payment processes because we use XRP or something like that. That beats that adds value compared to the non-blockchain solution because XRP speeds up the transactions to three to five seconds instead of three to five days. There you go. The blockchain has added value. But if you get it to a point where it it's like they're just using blockchain as like a fancy word to use, like, yeah, blockchain, we're using blockchain, but they're only using blockchain for like their map to manage their, their database. It's like, ah, eh, that's not really, you could use it, really the difference between using like a, a, a off blockchain database system versus a blockchain database system really isn't much. Like that's not important. So you're really looking for pro real problems to be really solved. And you're looking for the blockchain version of that to be a significant increase over the non-blockchain version. Um, and then next, we're looking at the prototype and feedback. So if it's possible and you, you're able to get like a demo of this project or something, you're able to use it. And, I mean, if, depending on how far you want to go with this, you can contact these companies and say, I'm really interested in this as a solution to a problem I have, can I have a demo or something? They will likely just say, yeah, here's, here's a demo, here's how it works. And if you can look at that and think, geez, this really solves my problem really well, um, then obviously now you're in the right direction. If you get that over a few different projects, like there's six different payroll things that you've used the demo for and they all, they all work, they all solve a problem, save that for later but at least you've got a small group of your research load is smaller and we're really honing in on projects that solve real problems because you understand the problem and how good it would feel to have that solved right yeah i hope you're really seeing the structure of this here and so now we're on to the decision making and elimination and we're going to do that by uh, elimination by aspects now elimination by aspects is decision making or well, decision makers that simplify the choice process by sequentially eliminating options that don't meet certain criteria. So focusing on one aspect at a time. 
what this causes is significantly less stress in the process, but still aligns with the priorities of what you're going for. So like I said, this is now truly reducing the research load down to one or two. So we've, we've taken it from 4,000, we've brought it down to 400, let's say, now we're down to our final, you know, let's say six, for example. Um, and for some, there might only be one uh, solution to a problem. And that, that's actually, I think, quite a nice thing. Um, and so what we ultimately are gonna do here is we're gonna use certain, like a, like a checklist. So you look at this project, you use this checklist, and you go through and you say, okay, it meets that criteria, that one, that one, that one. You could assign a score of like one per answer, per checklist item. And the one with the most points is the one that meets most of your criteria. Very easy, right? Super simple. So here is the checklist and the process. So first thing we need to do is we need to ask our question. Is the blockchain, the, is that blockchain or the blockchain they use scalable? Okay. Is it secure? Does it have all the security things in place? Do they emphasize security on their, on their website? And is it interoperable? Now, interoperability means can that blockchain work with other blockchains? Very important. So you can ask yourself those three questions for all of those. The next thing you need to look at is the team credibility. This is called uh, vetting. So you want to vet the, the company, the people that work at the company that you're interested in. Um, and so you're going to look into each person that's on their kind of senior leadership they'll if they don't have a page for for like their team and they're anonymous they're off already like that's a big x like don't get involved um the chances are that if you just put them to the side the chances are that was they were never worth paying attention to in the first place um so you can just do that as a general rule no team get it out of here so you want to evaluate their background and their expertise and their track record of the project team. So you want to look for three things. And again, these are one point per thing, just like these ones were. Um, does the team have a strong blend of blockchain technology experience, industry knowledge? So if, they're, if they came from a bank and their blockchain companies about payments, you know, it's a good industry knowledge. And do they have business acumen? Have they built other companies before that have su been successful? Have they been part of companies that have succeeded significantly and been fundamental to that? You go into their little history, you can go on LinkedIn, just scroll through, have a look at their history. You'll get a good idea of this um, as you go. So you might sometimes see someone who's made a, a blockchain company and you get in there and it's like, okay, he was, he was a, a sandwich artist at Subway literally before this company. Um, it doesn't mean he's not a genius and he's not amazing, but you can't make investment decisions based on based on that guess that you're guessing or hoping that he's a genius and he's like always had this in him, um, which may be the case, but you can't rest you can't put money behind that. So, you know, right now there are six points up for grabs. Um, the next one is to look at the market potential and the use cases. This run really I want to align this down to your gut feeling. Is the problem that is being solved by that company a little problem or a big problem? Okay, um, is zero points for little problem, uh, one point for big problem. I would even go as far as to say, just like if they don't have a team on their website, if it's a little problem, again, also don't like erase that one from the list. It has to be a big problem. Um, I'm setting you up for success. I'm not getting you to focus on small problems, focus on big problems. Look at the size of the, the market. Like if you look at, for example, the payroll example, I'm making this up, but payroll across the world could be $4 trillion a day. Literally, it could be $4 trillion. I'm, that might be an estimated guess, um, calculated guess. That's a big problem. If you can solve the issues with payroll, that's a big problem being solved, okay? A little problem would be, um, you know, oh, we help, we help tree surgeons be more efficient at cutting the, the trees. It's like, okay, it's a big problem for tree, for tree fitters, <laughs> like tree surger, surgeons, but as, as like a global thing, it's just not that big a deal. So, you know, you got the little problem, big problem thing. That's seven points up for grabs. Now you're gonna look at the community and ecosystem support. So do they have a strong and active community? and ecosystem that uh, support that can be indicative of the project's long-term viability. So you wanna look at development activity, 
you, all you have to do is type into Google, um, uh, insert blockchain name here, uh, developer activity, and you can look to see where it ranks in terms of developer activity. You can look on social media. I think one of the big things we're going to get into a little bit later on, just, just now in the legitimacy test, is really to make sure that the engagement that you're seeing on social media for that company is, is legitimate, it's real. So um, there'll be, there's ways to kind of see if they've paid for followers and stuff, um, but we'll get into that. And then you also want to be looking at their partnerships. There's no points available for that one, but you need to make sure that they do have social media and they do have some development activity and they do have some partnerships like they, those things all have to exist. So oftentimes you'll find that you'll, you'll be going into these tokens or these projects and you'll see that Microsoft has invested in them. You're like, what? <laughs> Microsoft invested in this company and no one's talking about it. Like those are the good ones that you find, you know. So then you've got to look at the financial health and tokenomics of the whole thing. Now, obviously, you really have to understand tokenomics to get a really good understanding. But, you know, the basics of it um, seem to be you want to try to avoid um, inflationary projects. So when more and more projects are being uh, tokens are being made, uh, it kind of suppresses the price a little bit. But if you understand tokenomics to a complex level, sometimes inflationary assets can be good. And you might know the difference, but there, then again, you're, uh, you're finding solutions to problems that you know about, right? Which is important. Again, it just leads back. Um, and then we want to make sure that they've got goals, because if you don't have goals in this thing, you're, you're everywhere. There's no direction. Um, if you imagine like you here and then your goal here, if you have no drive towards the goal, you're going to hit upon your goal accidentally, if ever. You might never hit your goal, but if you know it's exactly that many degrees up to the corner and you know exactly where to go, you can align all of your tasks and, and, and efforts on that one path. And so if they have a roadmap and milestones, that's a really good thing to, to, to look for. So evaluate all of your the projects that you've looked at. Where did they score on all of these things? Um, now you've narrowed it down even further. So we're going to narrow it down even more than that. Um, we're going to do some legitimacy tests on the projects that you've chosen. So the first thing is um, we're going to use heuristics. Now heuristics are basically like a, a speed dial for your brain. So it's almost like a quick checklist in your brain that you can just use and just quickly check things. It drastically reduces the stress of doing things because sometimes you think, oh, you've got to do the background checks and everything. On this, on this token, you're like, oh no, that sounds so boring and so frustrating. But heuristics gives you like these quick things to look for um, where you can discount or, or discredit points. So the first one is about website professionalism and clarity. So you want to look at their website's professionalism. How, how good does it look? Is it easy to navigate? Is the information really clear? And do they have, not only they should have clear communication, but they should also have comprehensive details in white papers and all that kind of stuff with their team about the project and about the technology. Um, do they have all of that that exists on there? So if you wanted to dive deeper, they have the information to, to look at. Um, but on the flip side, just for like the ease of the of user use, that's not very good a sentence. You want to make sure that like, have they got any spelling problems? <laughs> like, have they spelt something wrong? Or is a massive glaringly obvious you know, grammatical errors. Um, is, the, is the website designed really poorly? Is like, does it look like a bit of a scam? Like these are all things you have to look for. Um, and so I would emphasize the spelling and grammatical errors because if there are spelling and grammar errors, it means no one's double checking and they're speeding through to push this thing out as fast as possible. It's really bad look when you've got spelling and grammar errors, errors on a website like this. Um, the next thing you wanna look for again is that the team background and transparency. Um, anonymity or lack of information about the team can be a warning sign like just make just make sure that they do have a team you can look at their past achievements and professional reputation and all that kind of stuff on LinkedIn um, now the social media engagement you need to make sure on their on their social medias that they are actually having genuine engagement so if you look at their Twitter for example or YouTube and you see they've got 150,000 followers but they get like three comments on a tweet. Those aren't real followers. I'm sorry. It's just that the the percentages, the statistics, 
they don't lie. So if you've got high follow account and very low engagement, there's not much there in terms of like the community. And so can that community then get together behind a shared goal and, and lift that company up? Probably not because there's no one there. Um, if their last communication was like months ago, this is another sign that they're probably dead. Um, companies that are that have motivation, a real team, momentum, they will be having active discussions. They'll even probably even assign people just to talk on social media consistently. So look at their last post date. Um, and are they responsive to people's tweets at them? Do they do they reply to all the tweets? Are they positive? Are they are they helpful? Like these things are really important because they are reflective of the company culture um, as a whole. Um, then we're getting into the partnership side of things. So you need to verify these partnerships. You might see Microsoft, for example, on there. But if you see Microsoft, don't think they're partnered with Microsoft because they could have they literally could have just put Microsoft on the website. And, they, and just get and just try and get away with it. There's a, 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 a documentary on this on on Netflix of some guy literally putting all of these companies down there and you just scam people out of like hundreds of millions of dollars um, with fake partnerships. He even had a fake CEO and everything. It's crazy. So that happens in crypto. So make sure like if there's a Microsoft partnership, try and find the press release. There'll always be a press release if it's a big enough company. There'll always be a press release of a partnership. Try and find it on the, the Microsoft website. Try and find it on Google from multiple sources. Um, but you want to make sure that these partnerships are legitimate. Um, because they can be overstated or sometimes completely false. Um, next, we want to look at the technical documentation and the white paper. So we want to make sure that they've got detailed descriptions of the technology that they're using and their plan for the future, that roadmap. Um, they have to, you want them to have a really good idea of the problem that they're solving and if they can communicate the problem they're solving really well, because you know it, so you can read through all of this and you can, you can see through all the BS, right? You can see through it all, so you understand the problem. That's why it's so important for you to understand the problem. Um, you know whether that company will actually be solving that problem or not, right? Even though they've kind of tried to show it, can they? That's what you will understand. And then the next thing really is just to have a quick look at Google Trends. So go on, uh, I think it's like google.trends. We can just type Google Trends into Google and type in that project. You might type in the ticker code of the, of the cryptocurrency or you might type in the name of the company um, or both. You say like name of company, insert name of company here and then uh, crypto or something and see if the, there are anyone's talking about it online. So you can narrow it down to specific countries and all of that. But you want to see some sort of action happening. Um, but understand, like when we're lo looking at massive search volumes, some of these companies just won't naturally have massive search volumes because of the nature of where they are because um, they're, they're being built. These are companies being built. So they might not be widely talked about because we're doing our research here. So treat that's why this one is like not a color because it's like it's kind of optional. It can can help. And sometimes uh, it, it makes things a little bit harder. So now what we've done is we've taken 4000 cryptocurrencies, narrowed it down into one or two. Um, and now we're choose now we're trying to make the decisions of which ones to select and then also where to buy them. So th this whole section is just about ownership and decisions. And we want to get into the psych psychological element of ownership and why there's like actually even a desire for, for ownership in the first place. So psychological ownership refers to the state in which individuals feel as though the target of ownership is yours. Like the whole reason you're buying it is because you want it to be yours, right? And so when investors feel like they have a personal connection or a perceived sense of control over their investments, they're more likely to be engaged and committed to their choices. So as you've gone through this, which one, if you've got multiple options left, which one do you feel like you want? Like, I want this to be mine. I want to hold this. That's again, we, we're really drawing it back into the mindset of things. There's, there's too many like, most people ignore all of what they feel because they think what they feel is wrong, but I don't, I just don't think it is. Um, I think you're right. A lot of the time you just, your brain convinces you otherwise. So let's get more feeling into the heart. Like which ones do you have this ownership desire of? 
And you might, it might not be any of them. Um, and you can kind of table those assets and look for other problems and find other companies, go through the process again until you feel like that personal connection. Um, that personal connection is useful, but it doesn't mean you should hold on to that personal connection forever, um, which is like the whole, the whole thing behind leaving the market at the right time to actually lock in profit. Um, so there's a balance, there's a balance. I'm pretty sure once you all go through this like system and you've selected tokens, you're not going to be feeling like, I just want it to be mine. It's mine. Yes, I can't wait to own it. I feel like I'm going to adopt this cryptocurrency. I'm going to marry it. None of you are probably going to feel like that, but pay attention to like that, the desire to own one of those assets that you've got in your list. So in order to help with that, let's consider a few things. So the first thing we're going to consider is your values and interests, what matters most to you. So you've looked at all the problems, you've looked at all the solutions, um, which solutions matter the most to you and which companies are, are solving the problem that matters most to you. Um, specifically, like, so you want to consider the projects that align with your personal values um, and investing in projects that resonate with your beliefs can give you that deeper connection and sense of ownership that we've been potentially looking for. Um, so secondly, we want to determine where to buy the assets. What I will say is that there's probably a range of places you can buy those assets, but you want to look for a few things. You want to look for exchanges that offer strong security measures. So, you know, are they actually secure? There's a whole thing about exchanges where if, if it's on an exchange, it's not your crypto really in essence. Um, and so you might want to buy them somewhere on an exchange and if you can move them to a cold storage wallet, but that's a whole other video. Um, I would say look for user-friendly interfaces um, because if there are user-friendly interfaces, it is way harder and takes way more effort to create a website that's easy to use. Way more, 10 times more effort. So if you've got a website that's really bad and hard to use, it's quick and lazy. They've been lazy. Um, and this is why I like Uphold so much, right? Because Uphold, have have nailed it they've nailed ease of use uh coinbase nailed ease of use um and so you want to make sure that the i i think you need to be looking for places where the user interface is quite easy um and so that's subjective as well like if you're a trader any of the trading platforms would be easy to for you to use because you understand the the layout and everything but it has to be really based on how you feel about this um, they also need to have a good selection of other cryptocurrencies because you want to see that they have an indication of trust and reliability to, pro to provide these tokens as trading pairs. Um, then you want to consider liquidity. So this will be very hard to, to see, um, but there'll be ways for you, for you to find out. Like Uphold, for example, shares their liquidity. So it shares how much of each asset they have um, in, their, in their stores, in their uh, vault. Um, and so you can see whether they have been selling more than they have, and that's obviously a bad sign. It's going to be very hard to see liquidity for these other tokens, but you can look at like market caps and stuff. Um, and so oftentimes you'll see it on the chart, on the crypto chart itself. And on the crypto chart, with an asset that has very low liquidity, if you buy a little bit, you'll see the price just shoots up. Um, you don't really want to be involved in those ones unless you're very risk on. And you're, you, you're so passionate about the problem that they're solving and they're just brand new and they don't have any liquidity, but you're like, a, 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 what do you call it from earlier? Before the early adopters, you're like an innovator. Um, that's when you'll find those things, but you'll only really find that on small exchanges that don't have much liquidity. So small exchanges or very small cryptocurrencies. Um, and then it's got to fit with your portfolio. Um, and so I know many of you won't have even thought about how your portfolio is spread with, with any real thought. You kind of just buy the cryptos you buy and then you're given the percentages that that represents in your portfolio. In my exit strategy workshop, which is groundbreaking, if you like this, then you'll, you'll really like the exit strategy workshop. Um, and, it's, and it's money back guarantee. Like if you don't enjoy it, you go through the whole thing and it doesn't provide you value, then I'll give you your money back. Like, like I, it's that good. Um, there's no risk on your side for, for for getting that. But we really talk about fitting in the cryptocurrencies that you have and any investment that you have into a portfolio that makes sense, like uh, distribution wise. So you want to also be considering that. And of course, you can get that in the exit strategy uh, workshop. 
Now we're back into heuristics again, and this is making um, uh, making things nice and easy. So we're going to get into prospect theory and decision making under an uncertainty. So the first thing we're going to talk about is prospect theory. And prospect theory is understanding how people make decisions in situations of risk and uncertainty. Um, and then we're creating our process, that's our heuristics here. Heuristics, heuristics. And then we're also going to talk about loss aversion. So loss aversion is just a concept that I want to tell you about. And that is what we talked about earlier. It suggests that the individual feels more pain in the loss um, of something than they would feel the pleasure of the gain, the equivalent gain. And so if you have lots of risk aversion, um, it can often work against your goal because sometimes your goals and desires for where you want to be in life um, might require a bit more risk on behavior. So sometimes if you if you give in to that loss aversion mentality, then you'll often fall short of the goals in the first place, um, just from the get go. So what we need to do is we need to apply a decision making process that acts on reflection. Um, I think often this is like anti-impulse. So anti-FOMO, anti-impulse, anti-YOLO. <laughs> like this is what we're doing here. We're, we've, we've gone into all of this. We're about to make our purchase of the cryptocurrencies that we've we've researched. Now let's reel it back a bit. Let's, let's zoom out. Let's relax. Maybe let's wait to the next day. Um, but you'll go through this system when it comes time to actually make a decision because you've, you need to have taken time to reflect and these are the reflection points. So you want to weigh up the potential gains against the losses. Like what is the upside here? Um, is the upside significantly higher than the downside? At which point that's obviously going to be a positive thing for me. But I need to make that decision after some time having reflected on all the other things. Um, then you need to consider the psychological impact of holding that asset. If you've been in XRP, for example, you've been waiting for years for this thing to move. Um, I think most people have underestimated the psychological toll and impact that that takes. Me, me included, it's hard. It's, 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 I mean, one of the harder things you can do in investing is wait for something that was supposed to go sooner. Um, because you're imagining your life with all of this, like, wealth. <laughs> it's like, I'm still, I'm still here. <laughs> um, and so you have to consider that. Are you ready? Are you ready to wait for that to happen? Um, if needs be. Might not, might go the next day, but you know. The next one is looking at your scenario, so analyzing your scenario. You need to imagine both the best and the worst case scenarios of your investment. And, and what this does is it helps you mentally prepare for all the possible outcomes and it will reduce the shock or regret that might follow in a massive crash. So preparing, close your eyes, sit there for 10 minutes, have some nice like uh, music on, thinking purely only about the idea of losing all of that money. How do you really feel about that? How do you really feel about losing it all? Um, that's a, just a good practice just to get you mentally prepared for what you're going into. And also doesn't, doesn't put you under false pretenses. Like you know exactly what you're getting into when you're getting into it. Um, and again, this is all reflecting on what you're doing, which is just really important. Um, so next we want to set uh, clear investment goals. Like I said, if you have no goals, you, you have no direction, you might, you're hoping to basically stumble upon the goal, but you get there way quicker, way easier if you have a goal. No goal, no bueno. Um, and again, like in, in the Exit Strategy Workshop, we, we establish those goals, those desires um, to give you the most streamlined way of, of, of actioning it. I can't, I can't talk up that Exit Strategy Workshop enough and, you know, you've got uh, over 160 students that have taken it and they're all like loving it. There's been a few people have said, ah, oh, it was a bit too much for me, like a bit too much. Um, like this, this video might have felt, but the, the percentage is tiny of people that think that the rest are like, oh my goodness. Some people have been brought to tears from the stress relief of, of that thing. Um, and then you've got to look at your risk management strategies. So, um, again, I, it's really difficult because I'm trying to keep this this video siloed into research, um, but this confidence system I go through in my exit strategy, it builds 
it, it's a way for you to decide how much risk you're taking and not taking. Um, that's all in that in that workshop as well. Um, you just need to get an idea of of how much risk you're taking and how much you're happy taking. There's a there's a whole formula there, but I'll have to leave that. Um, next is to and this is what I said to have at the beginning really is reflective pauses before acting. So this reflective pause allows you to consider all the aspects of an investment um, before making your decision. Uh, because if you don't do any of that, you'll be driven solely by emotions, um, but a balanced consideration of the risks and rewards is what you want. And I think if you can put that like at the top, <laughs> put that reflective pause at the top, uh, yeah, at the end makes sense. And now, now I think about my, my logic for putting it here. It's kind of, you do all of these things, then you take a day or two, then you kind of, like, you've made that reflective decision. Once you've made that decision, you can then go and buy those those cryptocurrencies or that cryptocurrency. So that is the full rundown. I don't know how long that I went on for. That is the full rundown of how to do proper research um, for cryptocurrencies I think that that exists on on the internet. That's a bit of a bold statement for me to make there, um, but I really think that's like I I really just think that's massively valuable. So if you did enjoy this and you want to see more videos like this of me breaking down at length with research and scientifically backed and all of that kind of stuff, let me know. If you enjoyed it, click the subscribe button. It will tremendously help this video and like and share this with people who need to know this stuff because valuable. Valuable to say the least. If you want to be involved in something like this, but even more, four hours worth of content about exit strategy. That's how to leave the market when the time comes. This is researching and buying. Now you need to know how to leave, right? <laughs> the, the, this is all part of a bigger, like a bigger plan that you need to formulate. The exit plan, the taking profit plan, doing all of that in the most stress-free way possible to secure profits, to take profits at optimal times based on your dreams and goals and desires not somebody else's that's all linked in the description i hope you enjoyed um and if you're wondering can i download this document you've got all the way to the end no <laughs> no you can't the reason why you can't download this document is because if you download it you are the type of person who won't make it through the through to the end i don't want people watching these videos that can't take action um, and i don't mean to sound like all pushy but it's just like if you if you get something for free a, a workout regime for free or you pay 10 grand for a workout regime which one are you going to do you're going to make sure you do the one that you've paid for in this instance you're paying for it with some effort and brain power so go through the video again take it all down even if you type copied all of it at least it's going in and you'll 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 be in a better place than just copy and pasting because you'll put it in your files and you'll forget about it and you won't take any action i want people that do take action so therefore i'm not giving you this document you have to go through it yourself step by step so sorry but not sorry <laughs> anyway thank you everyone for watching stay emotionless and i'll see you in the next one